revolutions create in our societies. The first ones were mainly about energy sources, and these waves usually last about uh, 40 years. Um, during this wave, things disappear that you thought they will be there forever. And concepts and products and methods appear that you would never have thought have been possible. And so the, the steam engine basically started to start the industrial revolution. And I think you will all agree that the IT revolution is the last part of those. For instance, with the electrical um, revolution, um, the move from a candle uh, or a candle to a light bulb is not incremental evolution. It's a completely new thing. And uh, futurologists are pretty sure that the next constructive wave is a complete redefinition of psychosocial health. So what we define as health, how we preserve health, and how we cure diseases. So, these waves, as I said, start with a crisis. And then very often I hear, it is a crisis, everything is perfect. So, we first have to state and acknowledge the crisis of things. Number one problem is, with the exception of rare diseases, which are very often monogenetic, we do not understand any disease. What usually happens is that the patient, out of a state of complete physical health, comes to check up to a doctor. The doctor measures, oh, your blood pressure is elevated, or your cholesterol level is elevated. And then the disease is named after the symptoms. You have high blood pressure. You have asthma. You have heart failure. This is a description of a symptom in an organ. There's nothing more. So, in consequence, the only thing you can do is to treat the symptom. But if you can't repair something, you need to treat the symptom chronically. And that's why we have so many chronic diseases. The whole healthcare system has a range with them. Drug companies can constantly supply drugs. Patients every three months come to a doctor, get their new prescription, and you need to see a hospital occasionally to get fixed. So everyone is happy in that system. The only one who shouldn't be is the patient. So, 70% of what a medical doctor does, not if you're a brain surgeon, but if you're a GP for sure, is to prescribe a drug. And uh, this is uh, the status of 2015, hasn't changed nowadays. These were then the 10 drugs with the highest gross turnover. And the green patients are those that benefit from those drugs. And the red patients are those which will also receive those drugs according to guidelines. And we know they will not benefit from that drug. But they have to be treated in order to pick this one green patient. We have no way to differentiate between the green and the red patients. This is not a conspiracy theory, that's called the number needed to treat. You can calculate it from every regulatory phase we can do the trial. That's the situation. I would call that imprecision medicine. The consequence of that is that uh, with the Human Genome Project, of course, the pharma thought uh, that will change everything. What it has really changed, it has exponentially increased costs and the most recent estimate from uh, Tufts University who calculates that once in a while is it now costs six and a half 
billion dollars to bring one drug success successfully to the market in average, which of course has to pay for the company all the unsuccessful attempts. So despite this cost explosion, the green line, the number of new medical entities actually entering the market is more or less constant. So if the costs explode and the number of products remain the same, the industry has obviously a, a slight problem. But that's not a recent development. The number, this shows here the number of new drugs approved per billion dollar spent. Since the 1950s, this is in a constant decline. So pharma is getting worse and worse and worse. And it's not due to uh, tighter regulations uh, post thalidomide And it has also not improved with uh, biologicals. Biologicals have the same attrition rate as uh, small molecules. So obviously, 